book two chapter one of the fatal three by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain book two lachesis or the beginning of doom chapter one a wife and no wife mr castellani's existence was one of those social problems about which the idle world loves to speculate there are a good many people in london to whom the idea of a fourth dimension is not half so interesting as the notion of a man who lives by his wits and yet contrives to get himself dressed by a good tailor and to obtain a footing in some of the best houses at the smart end of the town this problem cesar castellani had offered to the polite world of london for the last three seasons who is mr castellani was a question still asked by a good many people who invited the gentlemen to their houses and made much of him he had not forced his way into society nobody had the right to describe him as a pushing person he had slipped so insidiously into his place in the social orbit that people had not yet left off wondering how he came there or who had been his sponsors this kind of speculation always stimulates the invention of the clever people and these affected to know a great deal more about mr castellani than he knew about himself he came with magnificent credentials and an account was opened for him at coutts before he arrived said magnus dudley the society poet flinging back his long hair with a lazy movement of a large languid head of course you know that he is the natural son of cavours indeed no i never heard that he is not like cavour of course not but he is the image of his mother one of the handsomest women in italy a duchess and daughter of a roman prince who could trace his descent in an unbroken line from germanicus castellani has the blood of caligula in his veins he looks like it but i have heard on pretty good authority that he is the son of a milanese music-master there are people who will tell you his father wheeled a barrow and sold penny ices in whitechapel retorted magnus people will say anything thus and in much otherwise did society speculate and in the meantime mr castellani's circle was always widening his book had been just audacious enough and just clever enough to hit the gold in the literary target nepenthe had been one of the successes of the season before last and mr castellani was henceforth to be known as the author of nepenthe he had touched upon many things below the stars and some things beyond them he had written of other worlds with the confidence of a man who had been there he had written of women with the air of a cafe de paris solomon and he had written of men as if he had never met one a man who could write a successful book and could sing and play divinely was a person to be cultivated in feminine society very few men cared to be intimate with mr castellani but among women his influence was indisputable he treated them with a courtly deference which charmed them and he made them his slaves no oriental despot ever ruled more completely than cesar castellani did in a half a dozen of those drawing-rooms which give the tone to scores of other drawing-rooms between mayfair and earl's court he contrived to be in request from the dawn to the close of the london season he had made a favour of going to riverdale and now although it suited his purpose to be there he made a favour of staying if it were not for the delight of being here i should be in one of the remotest valleys in the tyrol he told mrs hillersdon i have never stayed in england so long after the end of the season a wild longing to break loose from the bonds of philistinism generally seizes me at this time of year i want to go away and away and ever away from my fellow-men i should like to go and live in a tomb like the girl in oida's in marema my thirst for solitude is a disease this from a man who spent the greater part of his existence dawdling in drawing-rooms and boudoirs sounded paradoxical but paradoxes are accepted graciously from a man who has written the book of the season louise hillersdon treated castellani like a favourite son at his bidding she brought out the old guitar which had slumbered in its case for nearly a decade and sang the old spanish songs and struck the strings with the old dashing sweep of a delicate hand and graceful curve of a rounded arm when you sing i could believe you as young as helen when paris stole her said castellani lolling along the sofa beside the low chair in which she was sitting i cease to envy the men who knew you when you were a girl my dear castellani i feel old enough to be your grandmother unless you are really the person i sometimes take you for 
who may that be the wandering jew no matter what my creed or where i have wandered since i am so happy as to find a haven here granted that i can remember nero's beautiful empress and faustina and all that procession of fair women who illumine the dark ages and mary of scotland and emma hamilton blonde and brunette pathetic and espiegle every type and every variety it is enough for me to find perfection here if you only knew how sick i am of that kind of nonsense said mrs hillersdon smiling at him half in amusement half in scorn oh i know that you have drunk the wine of men's worship to satiety but if you and i had lived upon the same plane i would have taught you that among a hundred adorers one could love you better than all the rest but it is too late our souls may meet and touch perhaps thousands of years hence in a new incarnation do you talk this kind of nonsense to mrs greswold or her niece no with them i am all dullness and propriety neither lady is simpatica miss ransom is a frank good-natured girl much too frank with all the faults of her species i find the genius girl universally detestable miss ransom has about fifteen hundred a year i suppose you know that has she really if ever i marry i hope to do better than that answered cesar with easy insolence she would be a very nice match for a country parson that mr rawlinson for instance who is getting up the concert then miss ransom is not your attraction at enderby it is mrs greswold who draws you why should i be drawn he asked with his languid air i go there in sheer idleness they like me to make music for them they fool me and praise me and it is pleasant to be fooled by two pretty women does mrs greswold take any part in the fooling she looks like marble there is fire under that marble mrs greswold is romantically in love with her husband but that is a complaint which is not incurable he is not an agreeable man said louise remembering how long george greswold and his wife had kept aloof from her and he does not look a happy man he is not happy you know something about him more than we all know asked louise with keen curiosity not much i met him at nice before he came into his property he was not a very fortunate person at that time and he doesn't care to be reminded of it now was he out at elbows or in debt neither his troubles did not take that form but i am not a gossip let the past be past as goethe says we can't change it and it is charity to forget it if we are not sure about what we touch and hear and see or fancy we hear and touch and see in the present how much less can we be sure of any reality or external existence in the past it is all done away with vanished how can we ever know that it ever was a grave here and there is the only witness and even the grave and the name on the headstone may be only a projection of our own consciousness we are such stuff as dreams are made of that is a politely circuitous manner of refusing to tell me anything about mr greswold when his name was ransom no matter i shall find other people who know the scandal i have no doubt your prevarication assures me that there was a scandal this was on the eve of the concert at enderby at about the same hour when george greswold showed mildred his first wife's portrait castellani and his hostess were alone together in the ladies morning-room while hillersdon and his other guests were in the billiard-room on the opposite side of a broad corridor mrs hillersdon had a way of turning over her visitors to her husband when they bored her gusts of loud talk and louder laughter came across the corridor now and again as they played pool there were times when louise was too tired of life to endure the burden of commonplace society she liked to dream over a novel she liked to talk with a clever young man like castellani his flatteries amused her and brought back a faint flavour of youth and a dim remembrance of the day when all men praised her when she had known herself without a rival now other women were beautiful and she was only a tradition she had toiled hard to live down her past to make the world forget that she had ever been louise lorraine yet there were moments in which she felt angry to find that old personality of hers so utterly forgotten when she was tempted to cry out what rubbish you talk about your mrs egremont your mrs linley varden your professional beauties and fine lady actresses 
have you never heard of me louise lorraine the drawing-rooms at enderby manor had been so transformed under mr castellani's superintendence and with the help of his own dexterous hands that there was a unanimous expression of surprise from the county families as they entered that region of subdued light and aesthetic draperies between three and half past three o'clock on the afternoon of the concert the broadwood grand stood on a platform in front of a large bay window draped as no other hand could drape a piano with embroidered persian curtains and many-hued algerian stuffs striped with gold and against the sweeping folds of drapery rose a group of tall golden lilies out of a shallow yellow vase a cluster of gloxinias were massed near the end of the piano and a few of the most artistic chairs in the house were placed about for the performers the platform instead of being as other platforms in a straight line across one side of the room was placed diagonally so as to present the picturesque effect of an angle in the background an angle lighted with clusters of wax candles against a forest of palms all the windows had been darkened save those in the further drawing-room which opened into the garden and even these were shaded by spanish hoods letting in coolness and the scent of flowers with but little daylight thus the only bright light was on the platform the auditorium was arranged with a certain artistic carelessness the chairs in curved lines to accommodate the diagonal line of the platform and this fact in conjunction with the prettiness of the stage put every one in good temper before the concert began the concert was as other concerts clever amateur singing excellent amateur playing fine voices cultivated to a certain point and stopping just short of perfect training cesar castellani's three little songs words by heine music schubert and jensen were the hit of the afternoon there were few eyes that were unclouded by tears even among those listeners to whom the words were in an unknown language the pathos was in the voice of the singer the duet was performed with aplomb and elicited an encore on which pamela and castellani sang the old-fashioned flow on thou shining river which pleased elderly people moving them like a reminiscence of long-vanished youth pamela's heart beat furiously as she heard the applause and she curtsied herself off the platform in a whirl of delight she felt that it was in her to be a great public singer a second patty if if she could be taught and trained by castellani her head was full of vague ideas a life devoted to music three years hard study in italy a debut at la scala a world-wide renown achieved in a single night she even wondered how to italianize her name ransomini no that would hardly do pamelani pameletta what awkward names they were christian and surname both and then crimsoning at the mere thought she saw in large letters madame castellani how much easier to make a great name in the operatic world with a husband to fight one's battles and get the better of managers with an income of one's own it ought to be easy to make one's way thought pamela as she stood behind the long table in the dining-room dispensing tea and coffee with the assistance of maids and footmen her head was so full of these bewildering visions that she was a little less on the alert than she ought to have been for shillings and half-crowns whereby a few elderly ladies got their tea and coffee for nothing not being asked for payment and preferring to consider the entertainment gratis mildred's part of the concert was performed to perfection not a false note in an accompaniment or a fault in the tempo lady milborough a very exacting personage declared she had never been so well supported in her cheval de bataille the finale to la cenarentola but many among the audience remarked that they had never seen mrs greswold look so ill and both rawlinson and castellani were seriously concerned about her you are as white as marble said the italian i know you are suffering i assure you it is nothing i have not been feeling very well lately and i had a sleepless night there is nothing that need give any one the slightest concern you may be sure i shall not break down i am very much interested in the painted window she added with a faint smile it is not that i fear said castellani in a lower voice it is of you and your suffering i am thinking george greswold did not appear at the concert he was engaged elsewhere i cannot think how uncle george allowed himself to have an appointment at salisbury this afternoon said pamela i know he dotes on music 
perhaps he doesn't dote upon it quite so well as to like to see his house turn topsy-turvy said lady milborough who would have allowed every philanthropic scheme in the country to collapse for want of cash rather than suffer her drawing-room to be pulled about by amateur scene-shifters mrs hillersdon and her party occupied a prominent position near the platform but that lady was too clever to make herself conspicuous she talked to the people who were disposed to friendliness their numbers had increased with the advancing years and she placidly ignored those who still held themselves aloof from that horrid woman nor did she in any way appropriate castellani as her special protege when the people round her were praising him she took everything that happened with the repose which stamps the caste of vere de vere and may often be found among women whom the vere de veres despise all was over the last of the carriages had rolled away castellani had been carried off in mrs hillersdon's barouche no one inviting him to stay at the manor-house rolandson lingered to repeat his effusive thanks for mrs greswold's help it has been a glorious success he exclaimed glorious who would have thought there was so much amateur talent available within thirty miles and castellani was a grand acquisition we shall clear at least seventy pounds for the window i don't know how i can ever thank you enough for giving us the use of your lovely rooms mrs greswold and for letting us pull them about as we liked that did not matter much mildred said faintly as she stood by the drawing-room door in the evening light the curate lingering to reiterate the assurance of his gratitude everything can be arranged again easily she was thinking with a dull aching at her heart that to her the pulling about and disarrangement of those familiar rooms hardly mattered at all they were her rooms no longer enderby was never more to be her home it had been her happy home for thirteen gracious years years clouded with but one natural sorrow in the loss of her beloved father and now that father's ghost rose up before her and said the sins of the fathers shall be visited upon the children and because of my sin you must go forth from your happy home and forsake the husband of your heart she gave the curate an icy hand and turned from him without another word poor soul she is dead beat thought rolandson as he trudged home to his lodgings over a joiner and builder's shop airy and comfortable rooms enough but odorous of sawdust and a little too near the noises of the workshop he could but think it odd that he had not been asked to dine at the manor as he would have been in the ordinary course of events he had told the builder's wife that he should most likely dine out whereupon that friendly soul had answered why of course they'll ask you mr rollinson you know they're always glad to see you and now he had to return to solitude and a fresh killed chop it was seven o'clock and george greswold had not yet come home from salisbury very few words had passed between him and his wife since she fell fainting at his feet last night he had summoned her maid and between them they had brought her back to consciousness and half carried her to her room she would give no explanation of her fainting fit when the maid had left the room and she was lying on her bed white and calm with her husband sitting by her side she told him that she was tired and that a sudden giddiness had come upon her that was all he could get from her if you will ask me no questions and leave me quite alone i will try to sleep so that i may be fit for my work in the concert to-morrow she pleaded i would not disappoint them for worlds i don't think you need be over anxious about them said her husband bitterly there is more at stake than a painted window there is your peace and mine answer me only one question he said with intensity of purpose had your fainting fit anything to do with the portrait of my first wife i will tell you everything after the concert to-morrow she answered for god's sake leave me to myself till then let it be as you will he answered rising suddenly wounded by her reticence he left the room without another word she sprang up from her bed directly he was gone ran to the door and locked it and then flung herself on her knees upon the prie dieu chair at the foot of a large ivory crucifix which hung in a deep recess beside the old-fashioned fireplace here she knelt in tears and prayer deep into the night then for an hour or more she walked up and down the room absorbed in thought by the dim light of the night-lamp when the morning light came she went to a bookcase in a little closet of her room opening out of the spacious old bedroom a case containing only devotional books and of these she took out volume after volume taylor's rule of conscience hooker's religious polity 
butler paley one after another turning over the leaves looking through the indexes searching for something which she seemed unable to find anywhere what need have i to see what others have thought she said to herself at last after repeated failure clement canceller knows the right i could have no better guide than his opinion and he has spoken what other law do i need his law is the law of god not once did her eyes close in sleep all through that night or in the morning hours before breakfast she made an excuse for breakfasting in her dressing-room a large airy apartment half boudoir she was told that mr greswold had gone out early to see some horses at salisbury and would not be back till dinner-time he was to be met at the station at half-past seven she had her morning to herself pamela was rehearsing her part in the duet and in flow on thou shining river which was to be sung in the event of an encore that occupation and the arrangement of her toilette occupied the young lady till luncheon allowing for half-hourly rushes about the lawn and shrubberies with box whose health required activity and whose social instincts yearned for companionship he can't get on with only cassandra she hasn't intellect enough for him said pamela it was only ten minutes before the arrival of the performers that mrs greswold went downstairs pale as ashes but ready for the ordeal she had put on a white gown with a little scarlet ribbon about it lest black should make her pallor too conspicuous and now it was seven o'clock and she was alone the curate had been right in pronouncing her dead beat but she had some work before her yet she had been writing letters in the morning two of these she now placed on the mantelpiece in her bedroom one addressed to her husband the other to pamela she had a bag packed not one of those formidable dressing-bags which weigh fifteen to twenty pounds but a light russia leather bag just large enough to contain the essentials of the toilette she put on a neat little black bonnet and a travelling cloak and took her bag and umbrella and went down to the hall she had given orders that the carriage should call for her before going to the station and she was at the door ready to step into it when it came round she told the groom that she was to be put down at ivy cottage and was driven off unseen by the household who were all indulging in a prolonged tea-drinking after the excitement of the concert ivy cottage was within five minutes walk of romsey station a little red cottage newly built with three or four ivy plants languishing upon a slack-baked brick wall and just enough garden for the proverbial cat to disport himself in at his ease the swinging of cats being no longer a popular english sport there was nothing strange in mrs greswold alighting at ivy cottage unless it were the hour of her visit for the small brick box was occupied by two maiden ladies of small means one a confirmed invalid the other her patient nurse whom the lady of enderby manor often visited and in whom she was known to be warmly interested the coachman concluded that his mistress was going to spend a quarter of an hour with the two old ladies while he went on and waited for his master at the station and that he was to call for her on his return he did not even ask for her orders upon this point taking them for granted he was ten minutes too soon at the station as every well-conducted coachman ought to be i'm to call for my mistress sir he said as mr greswold stepped into the brougham where at ivy cottage sir miss fisher's very good the brougham pulled up at ivy cottage and the groom got down and knocked a resounding peal upon the queen anne knocker it being hardly possible nowadays to find a knocker that is not after the style of queen anne or a newly built twenty-five pound a year cottage in any part of rural england that does not offer a faint reminiscence of bedford park the groom made his inquiry of the startled little maid of all work fourteen years old last birthday and already aspiring to better herself as a vegetable maid in a nobleman's family mrs greswold had not been at ivy cottage that evening george greswold was out of the brougham by this time hearing the girl's answer stop where you are he said to the coachman and ran back to the station an evil augury in his mind he went to the up platform the platform at which he had alighted ten minutes ago did you see mrs greswold here just now he asked the station-master with as natural an air as he could command yes sir she got into the up train sir the train by which you came she came out of the waiting-room sir the minute after you left the platform you must have just missed her yes i have just missed her he walked up and down the length of the platform two or three times in the thickening dusk yes he had missed her she had left him such a departure could mean only severance some deep wound 
which it might take long to heal it would all come right by and by there could be no such thing as parting between man and wife who loved each other as they loved who were incapable of falsehood or wrong what was this jealous fancy that had taken possession of her this unappeasable jealousy of the dead past a passion so strong that it prompted her to rush away from him in this clandestine fashion to torture him by all the evidences of an inconsolable grief his heart was sick to death as he went back to the carriage helpless to do anything except to go to his deserted home and see what explanation awaited him there it was half-past eight when the carriage drove up to the manor-house pamela ran out into the hall to receive him how late you are uncle she cried and i can't find aunt everything is at sixes and sevens the concert was a stupendous success and only think i was encored indeed dear yes my duet with him and then we sang the other they would have liked a third only we pretended not to understand it would have made all the others so fearfully savage if we had taken it this speech was not a model of lucidity but it might have been much clearer and yet unintelligible to george greswold do you mind dining alone to-night my dear pamela he said trying to speak cheerily your aunt is out and i i have some letters to write and i lunched heavily at salisbury his heavy luncheon had consisted of a biscuit and a glass of beer at the station his important business had been a long ramble on salisbury plain alone with his troubled thoughts did your mistress leave any message for me he asked the butler no sir nobody saw my mistress go out when louisa went up to dress her for dinner she was gone sir but louisa said there was a letter for you on the bedroom mantelpiece shall i send for it sir no no i will go myself serve dinner at once miss ransom will dine alone george greswold went to the bedroom that fine old room the real queen anne room with thick walls and deep-set windows and old window-seats and capacious recesses on each side of the high oak chimney-piece and richly moulded wainscot and massive panelled doors a sober eighteenth-century atmosphere in which it is a privilege to exist a spacious old room with old dutch furniture of the pre-chippendale era and early english china worcester simulating oriental chelsea striving after dresden a glorious old room solemn and mysterious as a church in the dim light of a pair of wax candles which louisa the maid had lighted on the mantelpiece there between the candles appeared two letters george greswold esq miss ransom the husband's letter was a thick one and the style of the penmanship showed how the pen had hurried along driven by the electric forces of excitement and despair my beloved you asked me last night if the photograph which you showed me had anything to do with my fainting fit it had everything to do with it that photograph is a portrait of my unhappy sister my cruelly used unacknowledged sister and i who have been your wife for fourteen years know now that our marriage was against the law of god and man that i have never been legally your wife that our union from the first has been an unholy union and for that unlawful marriage the hand of god has been laid upon us heavily heavily in chastisement and the darning of our hearts has been taken from us whom he loveth he chasteneth he has chastened us george perhaps to draw us nearer to him we were too happy it may be in this temporal life too much absorbed by our own happiness living in a charmed circle of love and gladness till that awful chastisement came there is but one course possible to me my dear and honoured husband and that course lies in life-long separation i am running away from my dear home like a criminal because i am not strong enough to stand face to face with you and tell you what must be we must do our best to live out our lives asunder george we must never meet again as wedded lovers such as we have been for fourteen years god knows my affection for you has grown and strengthened with every year of union and yet it seems to me on looking back that my heart went out to you in all the fullness of an infinite love when first we stood hand clasped in hand beside the river if you are angry with me george if you harden your heart against me because i do that which i know to be my duty at least believe that i never loved you better than in this bitter hour of parting i spent last night in prayer and thought if there were any way of escape any possibility of living my own old happy life with a clear conscience 
i think god would have shown it to me in answer to my prayers but there was no ray of light no gleam of hope conscience answers sternly and plainly by the law of god i have never been your wife and his law commands me to break an unhallowed tie although my heart may break with it do you remember your argument with mr cancellor i never saw you so vehement in any such dispute and you took the side which i can but think the side of the evil one that conversation now seems to me like a strange foreshadowing of sorrow a lesson meant for my guidance little did i then think that this question could ever have any bearing on my own life but i recall every word now and i remember how earnestly my old master spoke how ruthlessly he maintained the right can i doubt his wisdom from whose lips i first learnt the christian law and in whom i first saw the true christian life i have written to pamela begging her to stay with you to take my place in the household and to be to you as an adopted daughter may god be merciful to us both in this heavy trial george be sure he will deal with us mercifully if we do our duty according to the light that is given to us i shall stay to-night in queen anne's gate with mrs tomkison please send louisa to me to-morrow with luggage for a considerable absence from home she will know what to bring you can tell her that i am going abroad for my health my intention is to go to a small watering-place in germany where i can vegetate away from all beaten tracks and from the people who know us you may rely upon me to bear my own burden and to seek sympathy and consolation from no earthly comforter do not follow me george should your heart urge you to do so respect my solemn resolution the result of many prayers your ever loving mildred End of chapter one book two chapters two and three of the fatal three by mary elizabeth radden this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the sins of the fathers george greswold read his wife's letter a second time with increasing perplexity and trouble of mind her sister what could this mean she had never told him of the existence of a sister she had been described by her father by every one as an only child she had inherited the whole of her father's fortune her cruelly used unacknowledged sister those words indicated a social mystery and as he read and re-read those opening lines of his wife's letter he remembered her reticence about that girl companion from whom she had been parted so early he remembered her blushing embarrassment when he questioned her about the girl she called fay the girl had been sent to a finishing school at brussels and mildred had seen her no more his first wife had finished her education at brussels she had talked to him often of the fashionable boarding-school in the quaint old street near the cathedral and the slight she had endured there from other girls because of her isolation there was no stint in the expense of her education she had as many masters as she cared to have she was as well dressed as the richest of her companions but she was nobody and belonged to nobody could give no account of herself that would satisfy those merciless inquisitors his wife vivian faux the young english lady whom he had met at florence she was travelling in the care of an english artist and his wife who spent their lives on the continent she submitted to no authority had ample means and was thoroughly independent she did not get on very well with either the artist or his wife she had a knack of saying disagreeable things and a tongue of exceeding bitterness a difficult subject the painter called her and imparted to his particular friends in confidence that his wife and miss faux were always quarrelling vivian faux that was the name borne by the girl whom he met nineteen years ago at an evening party in florence that was the name of the girl he had married after briefest acquaintance knowing no more about her than that she had a fortune of thirty thousand pounds when she came of age and that the trustee and custodian of that fortune was a lawyer in lincoln's inn who affected no authority over her and put no difficulties in the way of her marrying he remembered now when he first saw mildred fawcett something in her fresh young beauty some indefinable peculiarity of expression or contour had evolved the image of his dead wife that image which never recurred to him without keenest pain he remembered how strange that vague indescribable resemblance had seemed to him and how he had asked himself if it had any real existence or were only the outcome of his own troubled mind reverting involuntarily to an agonizing memory 
her face may come back to me in the faces of other women as it comes back to me in my miserable dreams he told himself but as the years went by he became convinced that the likeness was not imaginary there were points of resemblance the delicate tracing of the eyebrows the form of the brow the way the hair grew above the temples were curiously alike he came to accept the likeness as one of those chance resemblances which are common enough in life it suggested to him nothing more than that he went to the library with the letter still in his hand his lamp was ready lighted and the september evening being chilly there was a wood fire in the low hearth which gave an air of cheerfulness to the sombre room he rang and told the footman to send mrs bell to him bell appeared erect and severe of aspect as she had been fourteen and twenty years before neatly dressed in black silk with braided grey hair and a white lace cap sit down mrs bell i have a good many questions to ask you said greswold motioning her to a chair on the further side of his desk he was sitting with his eyes fixed looking at the spot where mildred had fallen senseless at his feet he sat for some moments in a reverie and then turned suddenly unlocked his desk and took out the photograph which he had shown mildred last night did you ever see that face before bell he asked handing her the open case good gracious sir yes indeed i should think i did but miss fay was younger than that when she came to parchment street did you see much of her in parchment street yes sir a good deal and at the hook too a good deal more than i wanted to i didn't hold with her being brought into our house sir why not i didn't think it was fair to my mistress but how was it unfair well sir i don't wish to say anything against the dead and mr fawcett was a liberal master to me and i make no doubt that he died a penitent man he was a regular church-goer and an upright man in all his ways while i lived with him but right is right and i shall always maintain that it was a cruel thing to a young wife like mrs fawcett who doted on the ground he walked upon to bring his natural daughter into the house mrs bell do you know that this is a serious accusation you are bringing against a dead man said george greswold solemnly now what grounds have you for saying that this girl with his hand upon the photograph was mr fawcett's daughter what grounds sir i don't want any grounds i'm not a lawyer to put things in that way but i know what i know first and foremost she was the image of him and next why did he bring her home and want her to be made one of the family and treated as a sister by miss mildred she may have been the daughter of a friend people don't do that kind of thing don't run the risk of making a wife miserable to oblige a friend retorted bell scornfully besides i say again if she wasn't his own flesh and blood why was she so like him she may have been the daughter of a near relation he had but one near relation in the world his only sister a young lady who was so difficult to please that she refused no end of good offers and of such a pious turn that she has devoted her life to doing good for the last five and twenty years to my certain knowledge i hope sir you would not insinuate that she had a natural daughter she may have made a secret marriage perhaps known only to her brother she couldn't have done any such thing without my knowledge sir she was a girl at school at the time of miss fay's birth don't mix miss fawcett up in it pray sir was it you only who suspected mr fawcett to be miss fay's father only me sir why it was everybody and what was worst of all my poor mistress knew it and fretted over it to her dying day but you never heard mr fawcett acknowledge the parentage no sir not to me but i have no doubt he acknowledged it to his poor dear lady he was an affectionate husband and he must have been very much wrapped up in that girl or he wouldn't have made his wife unhappy about her with but the slightest encouragement from mr greswold bell expatiated on the subject of fay's residence in the two houses and the misery she had wrought there she unconsciously exaggerated the general conviction about the master's relationship to his protege nor did she hint that it was she who first mooted the notion in the parchment street household she left george greswold with the belief that this relationship had been known for a fact to a great many people that the tie between protector and protected was an open secret 
she dwelt much upon the child mildred's love for the elder girl which she seemed to think in itself an evidence of their sisterhood she gave a graphic account of mildred's illness and described how fay had watched beside her bed night after night i saw her sitting there in her nightgown many a times when i went in the middle of the night to see if mildred was asleep i never liked miss fay but justice is justice and i must say looking back upon all things said mrs bell with a virtuous air that there was no deception about her love for miss mildred i may have thought it put on then but looking back upon it now i know that it was real i can quite understand that my wife must have been very fond of such a companion sister or no sister but she was so young that no doubt she soon forgot her friend memory is not tenacious at seven years old said greswold with an air of quiet thoughtfulness cutting the leaves of a new book which had lain on his desk the paper-knife marking the page where he had thrown it down yesterday afternoon indeed she didn't forget sir you must not judge miss mildred by other girls of seven she was she was like miss lola sir bell's elderly voice faltered here she was all love and thoughtfulness she doted on miss fay and i never saw such grief as she felt when she came back from the seaside and found her gone it was done for the best and it was the only thing my mistress could do with any regard for her own self-respect but even i felt very sorry miss fay had been sent away when i saw what a blow it was to miss mildred she didn't get over it for years and though she was a good and dutiful daughter i know that she and her mother had words about miss fay more than once she was very fond of her was she murmured george greswold in an absent way steadily cutting the leaves of his book very fond of her and you have no doubt in your own mind mrs bell that the two were sisters not the least doubt sir i never had answered bell resolutely she waited for him to speak again but he sat silent cutting his way slowly through the big volume without making one jagged edge so steady was the movement of the hand that grasped the paper knife his eyes were bent upon the book his face was in shadow is that all sir bell asked at last when she had grown tired of his silence yes mrs bell that will do good night when the door closed upon her he flung the book away from him sprang to his feet and began to pace the room up and down its length of forty feet from hearth to door sisters and so fond of each other he muttered my god this is a fatality in this as in the death of my child i am helpless the wanton neglect of my servants cost me the idol of my heart it was not my fault not mine but i lost her and now i am again the victim of fatality blind impotent groping in the dark web caught in the inexorable net he went back to his desk and re-read mildred's letter in the light of the lamp she leaves me because our marriage is unholy in her eyes he said to himself what will she think when she knows all as she must know i suppose sooner or later sooner or later all things are known says one of the wise ones of the earth sooner or later she is on the track now sooner or later she must know everything he flung himself into a low chair in front of the hearth and sat with his elbows on his knees staring at the fire if it were that question of legality only he said to himself if it were a question of church law bigotry prejudice i should not fear the issue my love for her and hers for me ought to be stronger than any such prejudice it would need but the first sharp pain of severance to bring her back to me my fond and faithful wife willing to submit her judgment to mine willing to believe as i believe that such marriages are just and holy such bonds pure and true all over the world even though one country may allow and another disallow one colony tie the knot and another loosen it if it were that alone which parts us i should not fear but it is the past the spectral past which rises up to thrust us asunder her sister and they loved each other as david and jonathan loved with the love whose inheritance is a life-long regret chapter three the verdict of her church 
it was nearly eleven o'clock when mrs greswold arrived at waterloo there had been a half-hour's delay at bishopstoke where she changed trains and the journey had seemed interminable to the overstrained brain of that solitary traveller never before had she so journeyed never during the fourteen years of her married life had she sat behind an engine that was carrying her away from her husband no words could speak that agony of severance or express the gloom of the future stretching before her in one dead level of desolation which was to be spent away from him if i were a roman catholic i would go into a convent to-morrow i would lock myself for ever from the outer world she thought feeling that the world could be nothing to her without her husband and then she began to ponder seriously upon those sisterhoods in which the anglican church is now almost as rich as the roman she thought of those women with whom she had been occasionally brought in contact whom she had been able to help sometimes with her purse and with her sympathy and she knew that when the hour came for her to renounce the world there would be many homes open to receive her many a good work worthy of her labour i am not like those good women she thought the prospect seems to me so dreary i have loved the world too well i love it still even after all that i have lost she had telegraphed to her friend mrs tomkison and that lady was at the terminus with her neat little brougham and with an enthusiastic welcome it is so sweet of you to come to me she exclaimed but i hope it is not any worrying business that has brought you up to town so suddenly papers to sign or anything of that kind mrs tomkison was literary and aesthetic and had the vaguest notions upon all business details she was an ardent champion of women's rights sent mr tomkinson off to the city every morning to earn money for her milliners decorators fads and proteges of every kind and reminded him every evening of his intellectual inferiority she had an idea that women of property were inevitably plundered by their husbands and that it was one of the conditions of their existence to be wheedled into signing away their fortunes for the benefit of spendthrift partners she herself being in the impregnable position of never having brought her husband a sixpence no it is hardly a business matter cecilia i am only in town en passant i am going to my aunt at brighton to-morrow i knew you would give me a night's shelter and it is much nicer to be with you than to go to an hotel the fact was that of the two evils mildred had chosen the lesser she had shrunk from the idea of meeting her lively friend and being subjected to the ordeal of that lady's curiosity but it had seemed still more terrible to her to enter a strange hotel at night and alone she who had never travelled alone who had been so closely guarded by a husband's thoughtful love felt herself helpless as a child in that beginning of widowhood i should have thought it simply detestable of you if you had gone to an hotel protested cecilia who affected strong language we can have a delicious hour of confidential talk i sent adam to bed before i came out he is an excellent devoted creature has just made what he calls a pot of money on mexican street railways but he is a dreadful bore when one wants to be alone with one's dearest friend i have ordered a cosy little supper a few natives only just in a brace of grouse and a bottle of the only champagne which smart people will hear of nowadays i am so sorry you troubled about supper said mildred not at all curious about the latest fashion in champagne i could not take anything unless it were a cup of tea but you must have dined early or hurriedly at any rate i hate that kind of dinner everything huddled over and the carriage announced before the piece de resistance and so you're going to your aunt is she ill has she sent for you at a moment's notice you will come into all her money no doubt and i am told she is immensely rich i have never thought about her money i suppose not you lucky creature it will be sending coals to newcastle in your case your father left you so rich i am told miss fawcett gives no end of money to her church people she has put in two painted windows at st edmund's a magnificent rose window over the porch and a window in the south transept by Burne jones a delicious design st cecilia sitting at an organ with a cloud of cherubs by the by talking of st cecilia how did you like my friend castellani he wrote me a dear little note of gratitude for my introduction so i am sure you were very good to him i could not dishonour any introduction of yours besides mr castellani's grandfather and my father had been friends that was a link he was very obliging in helping us with an amateur concert how do you like him 
but here we are at home you shall tell me more while we are at supper mildred had to sit down to the oysters and grouse whether she would or not the dining-room was charming in the daytime with its view of the park at night it might have been a room excavated from vesuvian lava so strictly classic were its terra-cotta draperies its butter-boat lamps and curule chairs how sad to see you unable to eat anything protested mrs tomkison snapping up the natives with gusto for it may be observed that the people who wait up for travellers or for friends coming home from the play are always hungrier than those who so return you shall have your tea directly mildred had eaten nothing since her apology for her breakfast she was faint with fasting but had no appetite and the odour of grouse fried bread-crumbs and gravy sickened her she withdrew to a chair by the fire and had a spider-legged tea-table placed at her side while mrs tomkison demolished one of the birds talking all the time isn't he a gifted creature she asked helping herself to the second half of the bird mildred almost thought she was speaking of the grouse i mean castellani said cecilia in answer to her interrogative look isn't he a heap of talent you heard him play of course and you heard his divine voice when i think of his genius for music and remember that he wrote that book i am actually wonderstruck the book is clever no doubt answered mildred thoughtfully almost too clever to be quite sincere and as for genius well i suppose his musical talent does almost reach genius and yet what more can one say of mozart beethoven or chopin i think genius is too large a word for any one less than they but i say he is a genius cried mrs tomkison elated by grouse and dry sherry the champagne had been put aside when mildred refused it does he not carry one out of one's self by his playing does not his singing open the floodgates of our hard battered old hearts no one ever interested me so much have you known him long for the last three seasons he is with me three or four times a week when he is in town he is like a son of the house and does mr tomkinson like him oh you know adam said cecilia with an expressive shrug you know adam's way he doesn't mind you must always have somebody hanging about you he said so you may as well have that french fool as any one else adam calls all foreigners frenchmen if they are not obtrusively german castellani has been devoted to me and i dare say i may have got myself talked about on his account pursued cecilia with the pious resignation of a blameless matron of five-and-forty who rather likes to be suspected of an intrigue but i can't help that he is one of the few young men i have ever met who understands me and then we are such near neighbours and it is easy for him to run in at any hour you ought to give him a latchkey says adam it would save the servants a lot of trouble yes i remember he lives in queen anne's mansions mildred answered listlessly he has a suite of rooms near the top looking over half london and exquisitely furnished he gives afternoon tea to a few chosen friends who don't mind the lift and we've had a materialization in his rooms but it wasn't a particularly good one added mrs tomkison as if she were talking of something to eat the maid louisa arrived at queen anne's gate a little before luncheon on the following day she brought a considerable portion of mrs greswold's belongings in two large basket trunks a portmanteau and a dressing-bag these were at once sent on to victoria in the cab that had brought the young person and the luggage from waterloo while the young person herself was accommodated with dinner table beer and gossip in the housekeeper's room she also brought a letter for her mistress a letter written by george greswold late on the night before mildred could hardly tear open the envelope for the trembling of her hands how would he write to her would he plead against her decision would he try to make her waver would he set love against law in such irresistible words as love alone can use she knew her own weakness and his strength and she opened his letter full of fear for her own resolution but there was no passionate pleading the letter was measured almost to coldness i need not say that your departure together with your explanation of that departure has come upon me as a crushing blow your reasons in your own mind are doubtless unanswerable i cannot even endeavour to gainsay them i could only seem to you as a special pleader making the worse appear the better reason for my own selfish ends you know my opinion upon this hard-fought question of marriage with a deceased wife's sister 
and you know how widely it differs from mr cancellor's view and yours which to my mind is the view of the bigot and not the christian there is no word in christ's teachings to forbid such marriages your friend and master clement cancellor is of the school which sets the law-making of a medieval church above the wisdom of christ am i to lose my wife because mr cancellor is a better christian than his master but granted that you are fixed in this way of thinking that you deem it your duty to break your husband's heart and make his home desolate rather than tolerate the idea of union with one who was once married to your half-sister let me ask you at least to consider whether you have sufficient ground for believing that my first wife was verily your father's daughter in the first place your only evidence of the identity between my wife and the girl you call fay consists of a photograph which bears a striking likeness to the girl you knew a likeness which i am bound to say bell saw as instantly as you yourself had seen it remember that the strongest resemblances have been found between those who were of no kin to each other and that more than one judicial murder has been committed on the strength of just such a likeness the main point at issue however is not so much the question of identity as the question whether the girl fay was actually your father's daughter and from my interrogation of bell it appears to me that the evidence against your father in this matter is one of impressions only and even as circumstantial evidence too feeble to establish any case against the accused is it impossible for a man to be interested in an orphan girl and to be anxious to establish her in his own home as a companion for his only child unless that so-called orphan were his own daughter the offspring of a hidden intrigue there may be stronger evidence as to fay's parentage than the suspicions of servants or your mother's jealousy but as yet i have arrived at none you possibly may know much more than bell knows more than your letter implies if it is not so if you are acting on casual suspicions only i can but say that you are prompt to strike a man whose heart has been sorely tried of late and who had a special claim upon your tenderness by reason of that recent loss i can write no more mildred my heart is too heavy for many words i do not reproach you i only ask you to consider what you are doing before you make our parting irrevocable you have entreated me not to follow you and i will obey you so far as to give you time for reflection before i force myself upon your presence but i must see you before you leave england i ask no answer to this letter until we meet your unhappy husband george greswold the letter chilled her by its calm logic its absence of passion there seemed very little of the lover left in a husband who could so write his contempt for a law which to her was sacred shocked her almost as if it had been an open declaration of infidelity his sneer at clement cancellor wounded her to the quick she answered her husband's letter immediately alas my beloved she wrote my reason for believing fay to have been my sister is unanswerable my mother on her deathbed told me of the relationship told me the sad secret with bitter tears her knowledge of that story had cast a shadow on the latter years of her married life i had seen her unhappy without knowing the cause on her deathbed she confided in me i was almost a woman then and old enough to understand what she told me women are so jealous when they love george i suffered many a sharp pang after my discovery of your previous marriage jealous of that unknown rival who had gone before me little dreaming that fatal marriage was to cancel my own my mother's evidence is indisputable she must have known as i grew older i saw that there was that in my father's manner when fay was mentioned which indicated some painful secret the time came when i was careful to avoid the slightest allusion to my lost sister but in my own mind and in my own heart i cherished her image as the image of a sister i am grieved that you should despise mr cancellor and his opinions my religious education was derived entirely from him my father and mother were both careless though neither was unbelieving he taught me to care for spiritual things he taught me to look to a better life than the best we can lead here and in this dark hour i thank and bless him for having so taught me what should i be now adrift on a sea of trouble without the compass of faith i will steer by that george even though it carry me away from him i shall always devotedly love ever in severance as in union your own mildred she had written to mr cancellor early that morning asking him to call upon her before three o'clock 
he was announced a few minutes after she finished her letter and she went to the drawing-room to receive him his rusty black coat and slouched hat crumpled carelessly in his ungloved hand looked curiously out of harmony with mrs tomkinson's drawing-room which was the passion of her life the shrine to which she carried gold and frankincense and myrrh in the shape of rose du barry and bleu du roi sevres veritable old sheraton tables and chairs and commodes and cabinets from the boudoir of marie antoinette a lady who must assuredly have sat at more tables and written at more escritoire than any other woman in the world give her majesty only five minutes for every table and ten for every bonheur du jour attributed to her possession and her married life must have been a good deal longer than the span which she was granted of joy and grief between the passing of the ring and the fall of the axe unsightly as that dark figure showed amidst the delicate tertiaries of lyons brocade and the bright colouring of satinwood tables and sevres porcelain mr canceller was perfectly at his ease in mrs tomkison's drawing-room he wasted very few of his hours in such rooms albeit there were many such in which his presence was courted but seldom as he appeared amid such surroundings he was never disconcerted by them he was not easily impressed by externals the filth and squalor of a london slum troubled him no more than the artistic intricacies of a west end drawing-room in which the cult of beauty left him no room to put down his hat it was humanity for which he cared persons not things his soul went straight to the souls he was anxious to save he was narrow perhaps but in that narrowness there was a concentrative power that could work wonders one glance at mildred's face showed him that she was distressed and that her trouble was no small thing he held her hand in his long lean fingers and looked at her earnestly as he said you have something to tell me some sorrow yes she answered an incurable sorrow she burst into tears the first she had shed since she left her home and sobbed passionately for some moments leaning against the tryon and spinet raining her tears upon the vernis martin in a way that would have made mrs tomkinson's blood run cold how weak i am she said impatiently as she dried her eyes and choked back her sobs i thought i was accustomed to my sorrow by this time god knows it is no new thing it seems a century old already sit down and tell me all about it said clement canceller quietly drawing forward a chair for her and then seating himself by her side i cannot help you till you have told me all your trouble and you know i shall help you if i can i can sympathize with you in any case yes i am sure of that she answered sadly and then falteringly but clearly she told him the whole story from its beginning in the days of her childhood till the end yesterday she held back nothing she spared no one freely as to her father confessor she told all i have left him for ever she concluded have i done right yes you have done right anything less than that would have been less than right if you are sure of your facts as to the relationship if mr greswold's first wife was your father's daughter then there was no other course open to you there was no alternative and my marriage is invalid in law questioned mildred i do not think so law does not always mean justice if this young lady was your father's natural daughter she had no status in the eye of the law she was not your sister she belonged to no one in the eye of the law she had no right to bear your father's name so if you accept the civil law for your guide you may still be george greswold's wife you may ignore the tie between you and his first wife legally it has no existence mildred crimsoned and then grew deadly pale in the eye of the law her marriage was valid she was not a dishonoured woman a wife and no wife she might still stand by her husband's side go down to the grave as his companion and sweetheart they who so short a time ago were wedded lovers might be lovers again all clouds dispersed the sunshine of domestic peace upon their pathway if she were content to be guided by the law should you think me justified if i were to accept my legal position and shut my eyes to all the rest she asked knowing but too well what the answer would be should i so think oh mildred do you know me so little that you need ask such a question when have i ever taken the law for my guide have i not defied that law when it stood between me and my faith 
am i not ready to defy it again were the choice between conscience and law forced upon me to my mind your half-sister's position makes not one jot of difference she was not the less your sister because of her parents sin and your marriage with the man who was her husband is not the less an incestuous marriage the word struck mildred like a whip stung the wounded heart like a sharp cut of a lash not one word more she cried holding up her hands as if to ward off a blow if my union with my very dear husband was a sinful union i was an unconscious sinner the bond is broken for ever i shall sin no more her tears came again but this time they gathered slowly on the heavy lids and rolled slowly down the pale cheeks while she sat with her eyes fixed looking straight before her in dumb despair be sure all will be well with you if you cleave to the right said the priest with grave tenderness feeling for her as acutely as an ascetic can feel for the grief that springs from earthly passions and temporal loves sympathizing as a mother sympathizes with a child that sobs over a broken toy the toy is a futile thing but to the child priceless what are you going to do with your life he asked gently after a long pause in which he had given her time to recover her self-possession i hardly know i shall go to the tyrol next month i think and choose some out-of-the-way nook where i can live quietly and then for the winter i may go to italy or the south of france a year hence perhaps i may enter a sisterhood but i do not want to take such a step hurriedly no not hurriedly said mr cancellor his face lighting up suddenly as that pale thin irregular featured face could lighten with the divine radiance from within not hurriedly not too soon but i feel assured that it would be a good thing for you to do the sovereign cure for a broken life you think now that happiness would be impossible for you anywhere anyhow believe me my dear mildred you would find it in doing good to others a vulgar remedy an old woman's recipe perhaps but infallible a life lived for the good of others is always a happy life you know the glory of the sky at sunset there is nothing like it no such splendour no such beauty and yet it is only a reflected light so it is with the human heart mildred the sun of individual love has sunk below life's horizon but the reflected glory of the christian's love for sinners brightens that horizon with a far lovelier light if i could feel like you if i were as unselfish as you faltered mildred you have seen louise hillersdon a frivolous pleasure-loving woman you think perhaps one who was once an abject sinner whom you are tempted to despise i have seen that woman kneeling by the bed of death i have seen her ministering with unflinching courage to the sufferers from the most loathsome diseases humanity knows and i firmly believe that those hours of unselfish love have been the brightest spots in her chequered life believe me mildred self-sacrifice is the shortest road to happiness no i would not urge you to make your election hurriedly give yourself leisure for thought and prayer and then if you decide on devoting your life to good works command my help my counsel all that is mine to give i know i know that i have a sure friend in you and that under heaven i have no better friend she answered quietly glancing at the clock as she spoke i am going to brighton this afternoon to spend a few days with my aunt and to tell her what has happened she must know all about fay if there is any room for doubt she will tell me my last hope is there end of chapters two and three book two chapter four of the fatal three by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four no light miss fawcett gertrude fawcett occupied a large house in lewes crescent with windows commanding all that there is of bold coastline and open sea within sight of brighton her windows looked eastward and her large substantial mansion turned its back upon all the frivolities of the popular watering-place upon its cockney visitors of summer and its november smartness its aquarium and theatre its london stars and pavilion concerts its carriages and horsemen few of whom ever went so far as the lewes crescent its brazen bands and brazen faces 
upon everything except its church bells which were borne up to miss fawcett's windows by every west wind and which sounded with but little intermission from no less than three tabernacles within half a mile of the crescent happily miss fawcett loved the sound of church bells loved all things connected with her own particular church with the ardour which a woman who has few ties of kindred or friendship can afford to give to clerical matters nothing except serious indisposition would have prevented her attending matins at st edmund's the picturesque and semi-fashionable gothic temple in a narrow side street within ten minutes walk of her house nor was she often absent from afternoon prayers which were read daily at five o'clock to a small and select congregation the somewhat stately figure of the elderly spinster was familiar to most of the worshippers at st edmund's all old brightonians knew the history of that tall slim maiden lady rightly clad by a style of her own which succeeded in reconciling puritanism with the fashion of the day very dignified in her carriage and manners with a touch of hauteur as of a miserable sinner who knew that she belonged to the salt of the earth brightonians knew that she was miss fawcett sole survivor of the great house of fawcett and company silk merchants and manufacturers st paul's churchyard and lyon that she had inherited a handsome fortune from her father before she was twenty that she had refused a good many advantageous offers had ranked as a beauty and had been much admired in her time that she had occupied the house in loose crescent for more than a quarter of a century and that she had taken a prominent part in philanthropic associations and clerical matters during the greater number of those years no charity bazaar was considered in the way of success until miss fawcett had promised to hold a stall no new light in the ecclesiastical firmament of brighton ranked as a veritable star until miss fawcett had taken notice of him she received everybody connected with church and charitable matters afternoon tea in her drawing-room was a social distinction and strangers were taken to her as to a royal personage her occasional dinners very rare and never large were talked of as perfection in the way of dining it is easy for her to do things well sighed an overweighted matron with her means and no family she must be inordinately rich did she come into a very large fortune at her father's death oh i believe old fawcett was almost a millionaire and he had only a son and a daughter but it is not so much the amount she inherited as the amount she must have saved think how she must have nursed her income with her quiet way of living only for indoor servants and a coachman no garden and one fat brougham horse she must be rolling in money she gives away a great deal nothing compared with what other people spend money goes a long way in charity ten pounds makes a good show on a subscription list but what is it in a butcher's book i dare say my three boys have spent as much at oxford in the last six years as miss fawcett has given in charity within the same time and we are poor people it pleased miss fawcett to live quietly and to spend very little money upon splendours of any kind there was distinction enough for her in the intellectual ascendancy she had acquired among those church-going brightonians who thought exactly as she thought her spacious well-appointed house her experienced servants cook housemaid lady's maid and butler her neat little brougham and perfect brougham horse realized all her desires in the way of luxury her own diet was of an almost ascetic simplicity and her servants were on board wages but she gave her visitors the best that the season or the fashion could suggest to an experienced cook even her afternoon tea was considered superior to everybody else's tea and her table was provided with daintier cakes and biscuits than were to be seen elsewhere her house had been decorated and furnished under her own direction and was marked in all particulars by that grain of puritanism which was noticeable in the lady's attire the carpets and curtains in the two drawing-rooms were silver-gray the furniture was french and belonged to the period of the directory when the graceful lightness of the louis seize style was merging into the classicism of the empire in miss fawcett's drawing-room there were none of those charming futilities which cumber the tables of more frivolous women here mr canceller would have found room and to spare for his hat room for a committee meeting or a mission service indeed on that ample expanse of silvery velvet pile a small arabesque pattern in different shades of grey 
the grand piano was the principal feature of the larger room but it was not draped or disguised sophisticated by flower vases or made glorious with plush after the manner of fashionable pianos it stood forth a concert grand in unsophisticated bulk of richly carved rosewood a broadwood piano and nothing more the inner room was lined with bookshelves and had the air of a room that was meant for usefulness rather than hospitality a large old-fashioned rosewood secretaire of the directory period occupied the space at the side of the wide single window which commanded a view of dead walls covered with virginia creeper and in the distance a glimpse of the crocketed spire of st edmund's a reproduction in little of one of the turrets of the st chapelle two-thirds of the volumes in those tall bookcases were of a theological character the remaining third consisted of those standard works which everybody likes to possess but which only the superior few care to read mildred had telegraphed in the morning to announce her visit and she found her aunt's confidential manservant a german swiss and her aunt's neat little brougham waiting for her at the station miss fawcett herself was in the inner drawing-room ready to receive her there was something in the chastened colouring and perfect order of that house in lewes crescent which always chilled mildred upon entering it after a long interval it was more than three years since she had visited her aunt and this afternoon in the fading light the silver-grey drawing-rooms looked colder and emptier than usual miss fawcett rose to welcome her niece and imprinted a stately kiss on each cheek my dear mildred you have given me a very agreeable surprise she said but i hope it is no family trouble that has brought you to me so suddenly she looked at her niece searchingly with her cold grey eyes she was a handsome woman still at fifty-seven years of age her features were faultless and the oval of her face was nearly as perfect as it had been at seven-and-twenty her abundant hair was silvery grey and worn a la marie antoinette a style which lent dignity to her appearance her dinner-gown of dark grey silk fitted her tall upright figure to perfection and her one ornament an antique diamond cross half hidden by the folds of her lace fichu was worthy of the rich miss fawcett yes aunt it is trouble that has brought me to you very bitter trouble but it is just possible that you can help me to conquer it i have come to you for help if you can give it my dear child you must know i would do anything in my power miss fawcett began with gentle deliberation yes yes i know mildred answered almost impatiently i know that you will be sorry for me but you may not be able to do anything it is a forlorn hope in such a strait as mine one catches at any hope her aunt's measured accents jarred upon her overstrung nerves her grief raged within her like a fever and the grave placidity of the elder woman tortured her there seemed no capacity for sympathy in this stately spinster who stood and scanned her with coldly inquisitive eyes can we be quite alone for a little while aunt are you sure of no one interrupting us while i am telling you my troubles i will give an order it is only half-past six and we do not dine till eight there is no reason we should be disturbed come and sit over here mildred on this sofa your maid can take your hat and jacket to your room stray garments lying about in those orderly drawing-rooms would have been agony to miss fawcett she rang the bell and told the servant to send mrs greswold's maid and to take particular care that no visitor was admitted i can see nobody this evening she said if any one calls you will say i have my niece with me and cannot be disturbed france the swiss butler bowed with an air of understanding the finest shades of feeling in that honoured mistress he brought out a tea-table and placed it conveniently near the sofa on which mildred was sitting and he placed upon it the neatest of salvers with tiny silver teapot and worcester cup and saucer and bread and butter such as titania herself might have eaten with an apricot or a bunch of dewberries then he discreetly retired and sent louisa who smelt of tea and toast already though she could not have been more than ten minutes in the great stony basement which would have accommodated a company of infantry just as easily as the spinster's small establishment louisa took the jacket and hat and her mistress's keys and withdrew to finish her tea and to discuss the motive and meaning of this extraordinary journey from enderby to brighton the gossips over the housekeeper's tea-table inclined to the idea that mrs greswold had found a letter a compromising letter addressed to her husband by some lady with whom he had been carrying on an intrigue in all probability mrs hillersdon of riverdale we all know who she was before mr hillersdon married her said louisa 
and don't tell me that a woman who has behaved like that while she was young would ever be really prudent mrs hillersdon must be fifty if she's a day but she is a handsome woman still and who knows she may have been an old flame of my master's that's it sighed france assentingly it's generally an old flame that does the mischief wir sind armertieren and now my dear tell me what has gone wrong with you said miss fawcett seating herself on the capacious sofa low broad luxurious one of crundon's masterpieces beside her niece the rooms were growing shadowy a small fire burned in the bright steel grate and made the one cheerful spot in the room touching the rich bindings of the books with gleams of light oh it is a long story aunt i must begin at the beginning i have a question to ask you and your answer means life or death to me a question to ask me miss fawcett uttered the words slowly spacing them out one by one in her clear calm voice the voice that had spoken at committee meetings and had laid down the law in matters charitable and ecclesiastical many times in that good town of brighton i must go back to my childhood aunt in the first place began mildred in her low earnest voice her hands clasped her eyes fixed upon her aunt's coldly correct profile between her and the light of the fire the wide window behind her with the day gradually darkening after the autumnal sunset the three eastward-looking windows in the large room beyond had a ghostly look with their long guipure curtains closely drawn against the dying light i must go back to the time when i was seven years old and my dear father falteringly and with tears in her voice brought home his adopted daughter fay fay fawcett he called her she was fourteen and i was only seven but i was very fond of her all the same we took to each other from the beginning when we left london and went to the hook fay went with us i was ill there and she helped to nurse me she was very good to me kinder than i can say and i loved her as if she had been my sister but when i got well she was sent away sent to a finishing school at brussels and i never saw her again she had only lived with us one short summer yet it seemed as if she and i had been together all my life i missed her sorely i missed her for years afterwards my tender-hearted mildred said miss fawcett gently it was like you to give your love to a stranger and to be so faithful to her memory oh but she was not a stranger she was something nearer and dearer i could hardly have been so fond of her if there had not been some link between us nonsense mildred a warm-hearted child would take to any one near her own age who was kind to her why should this girl have been anything more than an orphan whom your father adopted out of the generosity of his heart oh she was something more there was a mystery did you ever see her aunt i don't remember your coming to parchment street or to the hook while she was with us no i was away from england part of that year i spent the autumn at baden with my friends the templemores and then you knew nothing of the trouble fay made in our home most innocently it is such a sad story aunt i can't hardly bear to touch upon it even to you for it cast a shadow upon my father's character you know how i loved and honoured him and how it must pain me to say one word that reflects upon him yes i know you loved him you could not love him too well mildred he was a good man a large-hearted large-minded man and yet that one act of his bringing poor fay into his home brought unhappiness upon us all my mother seemed set against her from the very first and on her deathbed she told me that fay was my father's daughter she gave me no proof she told me nothing beyond that one cruel fact fay was the offspring of a hidden sin she told me this and told me to remember it all my life do you think aunt she was justified in this accusation against my father how can i tell mildred miss fawcett answered coldly my brother may have had secrets from me but did you never hear anything any hint of this mystery did you never know about your brother's life in the years before his marriage which would serve as a clue he could hardly have cared for any one been associated with any one and you not hear something if you mean did i ever hear that my brother had a mistress i can answer no replied miss fawcett in a very unsympathetic voice 
but men do not usually allow such things to be known to their sisters especially to a younger sister as i was by a good many years he may have been like other men few of them seem free from the stain of sin but however that may have been i know nothing about the matter and you do not know the secret of fay's parentage you my father's only sister his only surviving relation can you help me to find any one who knew more about his youth any confidential friend any one who can tell me whether that girl was really my sister no mildred i have no knowledge of your father's friends they are all dead and gone perhaps but what can it matter to you who this girl was she is dead let the secret of her existence die with her it is wisest most charitable to do so ah you know she is dead cried mildred quickly where and when did she die how did you hear of her from your father she died abroad i do not remember the year was it before my marriage yes i believe so long before two or three years perhaps i cannot tell you anything precisely the matter was of no moment to me oh aunt it is life and death to me she was my husband's first wife she and i daughters of one father as i alas can but believe we were married the same man i never heard your husband was a widower no nor did i know it until a few weeks ago and then as clearly as her distress of mind would allow mildred told how the discovery had been made the evidence of a photograph which may be a good or a bad likeness is a small thing to go upon mildred said her aunt i think you have been very foolish to make up your mind upon such evidence oh but there are other facts coincidences and nothing would make me doubt the identity of the original of that photograph with fay fawcett i recognized it at the first glance and bell who saw it afterwards knew the face immediately there could be no error in that the only question is about her parentage i thought if there were room for doubt in the face of my mother's deathbed statement you could help me but it is all over you were my last hope said mildred despairingly she let her face sink forward upon her clasped hands only in this moment did she know how she had clung to the hope that her aunt would be able to assure her she was mistaken in her theory of fay's parentage my dear mildred began miss fawcett after a pause the words you have just used death-bed statement seem to mean something very solemn indisputable irrevocable but i must beg you to remember that your poor mother was a very weak woman and a very exacting wife she was offended with my brother for his adoption of an orphan girl i have heard her hold forth about her wrongs many a time vaguely not daring to accuse him before me but still i could understand the drift of her thoughts she may have nursed these vague suspicions of hers until they seemed to her like positive facts and on her deathbed her brain enfeebled by illness she may have made direct assertions upon no other ground than those long cherished suspicions and the silent jealousies of years i do not think mildred you ought to take any decisive step upon the evidence of your mother's jealousy my mother spoke with conviction she must have known something she must have had some proof but even if it were possible she could have spoken so positively without any other ground than jealous feeling there are other facts that cry aloud to me evidences to which i dare not shut my eyes fay must have belonged to some one aunt pursued mildred with growing earnestness clasping her hands upon miss fawcett's arm as they sat side by side in the gathering darkness there must have been some reason and a strong one for her presence in our house my father was not a man to set upon caprice i never remember any foolish or frivolous act of his in all the years of my girlhood he was a man of thought and purpose he did nothing without a motive he would not have charged himself with the care of that poor girl unless he had considered it his duty to protect her perhaps not i am sure not then comes the question who was she if she was not my father's daughter he had no near relations he had no bosom friend that i ever heard of 
no friend so dear that he would deem it his duty to adopt that friend's orphan child there is no other clue to the mystery that i can imagine can you aunt suggest any other solution no mildred i cannot if there were no other evidence within my knowledge my father's manner alone would have given me a clue to his secret he so studiously evaded my inquiries about fay there was such a settled melancholy in his manner when he spoke of her poor john he had a heart of gold mildred there never was a truer man than your father be sure of that come what may i have never doubted that there was a pause of some minutes after this the two women sat in silence looking at the fire which had burned red and hollow since france had last attended to it mildred sat with her head leaning against her aunt's shoulder her hand clasping her aunt's hand miss fawcett sat erect as a dart looking steadily at the fire her lips compressed and resolute the image of unfaltering purpose and now mildred she began at last in those measured accents which mildred remembered in her childhood as an association of awe take an old woman's advice and profit by an old woman's experience of life if you can put this suspicion of yours on one side forget it as if it had never been and go back to your good and faithful husband this suspicion of yours is but a suspicion at most founded on the jealous fancy of one of the most fanciful women i ever knew why should george greswold's life be made desolate because your mother was a bundle of nerves forget all you have ever thought about that orphan girl and go back to your duty as a wife mildred started away from her aunt and left the sofa as if she had suddenly discovered herself in contact with the evil one aunt you astound you horrify me she exclaimed can you be so false to the conduct and principles of your whole life can you put duty to a husband before duty to god have i not sworn to honour him with all my heart with all my strength and am i to yield to the weak counsel of my heart which would put my love of the creature above my honour of the creator would you counsel me to persist in an unholy union you whose life has been given up to the service of god you who have put his service far above all earthly affections you who have shown yourself so strong can you counsel me to be so weak and to let my love my fond true love for my dear one conquer my knowledge of the right who knows if my darling's death may not have been god's judgment upon iniquity god's judgment she had burst into sudden tears at the mention of her husband's name with all that tenderness his image evolved but at that word judgment she stopped abruptly with a half hysterical cry as a vision of the past flashed into her mind she remembered the afternoon of the return to enderby and how her husband had knelt by his daughter's grave believing himself alone and how there had come up from that prostrate figure a bitter cry judgment judgment did he know was that the remorseful ejaculation of one who knew himself a deliberate sinner miss fawcett endured this storm of reproof without a word she never altered her attitude or wavered in her quiet contemplation of the fading fire she waited while mildred paced up and down the room in a tempest of passionate feeling and then she said even more quietly than she had spoken before my dear mildred i have given you my advice conscientiously if you refuse to be guided by the wisdom of one who is your senior by a quarter of a century the consequences of your obstinacy must be upon your own head i only know that if i had as good a man as george greswold for my husband with a little catch in her voice that sounded almost like a sob it would take a great deal more than a suspicion to part me from him and now mildred if you mean to dress for dinner it is time you went to your room in any other house and with any other hostess mildred would have asked to be excused from sitting down to a formal dinner and to spend the rest of the evening in her own room but she knew her aunt's dislike of any domestic irregularity so she went away meekly and put on the black lace gown which louisa had laid out for her and returned to the drawing-room at five minutes before eight she had been absent half an hour but it seemed to her as if miss fawcett had not stirred since she left her the lamps were lighted the fire had been made up and the silver-gray brocade curtains were drawn but the mistress of the house was sitting in exactly the same attitude on the sofa near the fire erect 
motionless with her thoughtful gaze fixed upon the burning coals in the bright steel grate aunt and niece dined tete-a-tete -tete, ministered to by the experienced franz who was thorough master of his calling all the details of that quiet dinner were of an elegant simplicity but everything was perfect after its fashion from the soup to the dessert from the irish damask to the old english silver everything just as befitted the station of a lady who was often spoken of as the rich miss fawcett the evening passed in mournful quiet mildred played two of mozart's sonatas at her aunt's request sonatas which she had played in her girlhood before the advent of her first and only lover the lover who was now left widowed and desolate in that time which should have been the golden afternoon of life as her fingers played those familiar movements her mind was at enderby with the husband she had deserted how was he bearing his solitude would he shut his heart against her in anger teach himself to live without her she pictured him in his accustomed corner of the drawing-room with his lamp-lit table and pile of books and papers and pamela seated on the other side of the room and the dogs lying on the hearth and the room all aglow with flowers in the subdued light of the shaded lamps so different from these colourless rooms of miss fawcett's with their look as of vaulted halls in which voices echo with hollow reverberations amidst empty space and then she thought of her own desolate life and wondered what it was to be she felt as if she had no strength of mind to chalk out a path for herself to create for herself a mission that sublime idea of living for others of a life devoted to finding the lost ones of israel or nursing the sick or teaching children the way of righteousness left her cold her thoughts dwelt persistently upon her own loves her own losses her own ideal of happiness i am of the earth earthy she thought despairingly as her fingers lingered over a slow movement if i were like clement canceller my own individual sorrow would seem as nothing compared with that vast sum of human suffering which he is always trying to lessen may i ask what your plans are for the future mildred said miss fawcett laying aside a memoir of bishop selwyn which she had been reading while her niece played i need hardly tell you that i shall be pleased to have you here as long as you care to stay but i should like to know your scheme of life in the event of your persistence in a separation from your husband i have made no definite plan aunt i shall spend the autumn in some quiet watering-place in germany and perhaps go to italy for the winter why to italy it is the dream of my life to see that country and my husband always refused to take me there for some good reason no doubt i believe he had a dread of fever i know of no other reason you are prompt to take advantage of your independence indeed aunt i have no idea of that kind god help me my independence is a sorry privilege but if any country could help me to forget my sorrows that country would be italy and after the winter do you mean to live abroad altogether i don't know what i may do i have thoughts of entering a sisterhood by and by well you must follow your own course mildred i can say no more than i have said already if you make up your mind to renounce the world there are sisterhoods all over england and there is plenty of good work to be done perhaps after all it is the best life and that those are happiest who shut their minds against earthly affections as you have done aunt said mildred with respect i know how full of good works your life has been i have tried to do my duty according to my lights answered the spinster gravely the next day was cold and stormy autumn with a foretaste of winter mildred went to the morning service with her aunt in the bright new gothic church which miss fawcett's liberality had helped to create a picturesque temple with clustered columns and richly floriated capitals diapered roof and encaustic pavement and over all things the glow of many coloured lights from painted windows miss fawcett spent the morning in visiting among the poor she had a large district out in the london road in a part of brighton of which the fashionable brightonian hardly knoweth the existence mildred sat in the back drawing-room all the morning pretending to read she took volume after volume out of the bookcase turned over the leaves or sat staring at a page for a quarter of an hour at a time in hopeless vacuity of mind she had brooded upon her trouble until her brain seemed benumbed and nothing was left of that sharp sorrow but a dull aching pain 
after luncheon she went out for a solitary walk on the cliff road that leads eastward it was a relief to find herself alone upon that barren down with the great stormy sea in front of her and the busy world left behind she walked all the way to rottingdean rejoicing in her solitude dreading the return to the stately silver-grey drawing-room and her aunt's society looking down at the village nestling in the hollow of the hills it seemed to her that she might hide her sorrows almost as well in that quiet nook as in the remotest valley in europe and it seemed to her also that this place of all others was best fitted for the establishment of any charitable foundation in a small way for a home for the aged poor for instance or for orphan children her own fortune would amply suffice for any such modest foundation the means were at her disposal only the will was wanting it was growing dusk when she went back to Lewes crescent so she went straight to her room and dressed for dinner before going to the drawing-room the wind with its odour of the sea had refreshed her she felt less depressed better able to face a lifelong sorrow than before she went out but physically she was exhausted by the six-mile walk and she looked pale as ashes in her black gown with its evening bodice showing the alabaster throat and a large black enamel locket set with a monogram in diamonds l g laura greswold she entered the inner room her aunt was not there and there was only one large reading lamp burning on a table near the fire the front drawing-room was in shadow she went towards the piano intending to play to herself in the twilight but as she moved slowly in the direction of the instrument a strong band played the closing bars of a fugue by sebastian bach a chain of solemn chords that faded slowly into silence the hands that played those chords were the hands of a master it was hardly a surprise to mildred when a tall figure rose from the piano and cesar castellani stood before her in the dim light his hat and gloves were upon the piano as if he had just entered the room my dear mrs greswold how delightful to find you here i came to make a late call upon your aunt she is always indulgent to my bohemian indifference to etiquette and had not the least idea that i should see you i did not know that you and my aunt were friends no interrogatively that is very odd for we are quite old friends miss fawcett was all goodness to me when i was an idle undergraduate yet when you came to enderby you brought an introduction from mrs tomkinson surely my aunt would have been a better person no doubt but it is just like me to take the first sponsor who came to hand when i am in london i half live at mrs tomkison's and i had heard her rave about you until i became feverishly anxious to make your acquaintance i ought perhaps to have referred to miss fawcett for my credentials but i am volage by nature and then i knew mrs tomkison would exaggerate my virtues and ignore my errors mildred went back to the inner room and seated herself by the reading lamp castellani followed her and placed himself on the other side of the small octagon table leaving only a narrow space between them how pale you are he said with a look of concern i hope you are not ill no i am only tired after a long walk i had no idea you had left enderby indeed you said nothing of your intention of leaving the neighbourhood the day before yesterday there was no occasion to talk of my plans mildred answered coldly we were all too anxious about the concert to think of any other matter did you leave soon after the concert the same evening i did not know you were leaving riverdale oh i only stayed for the concert i had protracted my visit unconscionably but mrs hillersdon was good enough not to seem tired of me i am in nobody's way and i contrived to please her with my music did you not find her delightfully artistic i thought her manners charming and she seems fond of music if that is what you mean by being artistic oh i mean worlds more than that mrs hillersdon is artistic to her fingers end in everything she does one feels the artist her dress her hair her way of ordering a dinner or arranging a room her feeling for literature she seldom reads her feeling for form and colour she cannot draw a line her personality is the very essence of modern art she is as a woman what ruskin is as a man is miss ransome with you no i have left her to keep house for me it seemed a futile thing to make believe that all was well at enderby 
to ward off explanations when before long the world must know that george greswold and his wife were parted for ever some reason would have to be given that thirst for information about the inner life of one's neighbours which is the ruling passion of this waning century must be slaked somehow it was partly on this account perhaps that mildred fancied it would be a good thing for her to enter a sisterhood the curious could be satisfied then it would be said that mrs greswold had given up the world she is a very sweet girl said castellani thoughtfully pretty too a delicious complexion hair that suggests sabrina after a visit from the hairdresser a delightful figure and very nice manners but she leaves me as cold as ice why is it that only a few women in the world have magnetic power they are so few and their influence is so stupendous think of the multitude of women of all nations colours and languages that go to make up one cleopatra or one mary stuart miss fawcett came into the room while he was talking and was surprised at seeing him in such earnest conversation with her niece one would suppose you had known each other for years she said as she shook hands with castellani looking from one to the other and so we have he answered gaily in some lives weeks mean years i sometimes catch myself wondering what the world was like before i knew mrs greswold how long have you known her without rodomontade for about a month aunt replied mildred i have been asking mr castellani why he came to me with an introduction from my friend mrs tomkison when it would have been more natural to present himself as a friend of yours oh he has always a motive for what he does miss fawcett said coldly you will stay to dinner of course she added to castellani i am free for this evening and i should like to stay if you can forgive my morning coat i am used to irregularities from you give mrs greswold your arm france was at the door announcing the evening meal and presently mildred found herself seated at the small round table in the sombre spacious dining-room a room with a bayed front commanding an illimitable extent of sea with cesar castellani sitting opposite her the meal was livelier than the dinner of last night castellani appeared unconscious that mildred was out of spirits he was full of life and gaiety and had an air of happiness which was almost contagious his conversation was purely intellectual ranging through the world of mind and of fancy scarcely touching things earthly and human and thus he struck no jarring chord in mildred's weary heart so far as she could be distracted from the ever-present thought of loss and sorrow his conversation served to distract her he went up to the drawing-room with the two ladies and at miss fawcett's request sat down to the piano the larger room was still in shadow the smaller bright with fire and lamplight he played as only the gifted few can play played as one in whom music is a sixth sense but to-night his music was new to mildred he played none of those classic numbers which had been familiar to her ever since she had known what music meant his muse to-night was full of airy caprices quips and cranks and wreathed smiles it was operatic music of the stage stagey a music which seemed on a level with watteau or tissot in the sister art gay to audacity and sentimental to affectation it was charming music all the same charged with melody gracious complacent uncertain like an april day whatever it was every movement was familiar to gertrude fawcett she sat with her long ivory knitting needles at rest on her lap sat in a dreamy attitude gazing at the fire and listening intently some melodies seemed to touch her almost to tears the love of music ran in the fawcett family and it was no surprise to mildred to see her aunt so absorbed what had an elderly spinster to live for if it were not for philanthropy and art and for the plastic arts for pictures and porcelain statuary or high art furniture miss fawcett cared not a jot as those barren drawing-rooms with their empty walls and pallid colour bore witness music she loved with unaffected devotion and it was in no wise strange to find her the friend and patroness of cesar castellani opposite as were the opinions of the man who wrote nepenthe and the woman who had helped to found the church of st edmund the confessor play the duet at the end of the second act she said when he paused after a brilliant six-eighth movement which suggested a joyous chorus he played a cantaboli accompaniment like the flow of summer seas and then a plaintive melody for two voices following answering echoing each other with tearful emphasis 
a broken phrase here and there as if the singer were choked by a despairing sob what is the name of that opera aunt asked mildred i never heard any of that music before he has been playing selections from different operas that last melody is a duet in an opera called la donna del pittore by what composer it sounded like floto it is not floto's that opera was written by mr castellani's father i remember he told me his father had written operas it is a pity his music was never known in england you had better say it was a pity his music was never fashionable in paris had it been recognized there english connoisseurs would have speedily discovered its merits we are not a musical nation mildred we find new planets but we never discover new musicians we took up weber only to neglect him and break his heart we had not taste enough to understand Mendelssohn's melusine mr castellani's operas were popular in italy were they not for a time yes but the italians are as capricious as we are dull cesar tells me that his father's operas have not held the stage were they fashionable in your time aunt when you were studying music at milan yes they were often performed at that time i used to hear them occasionally and you like them now they are associated with your girlhood i can understand that they must have a peculiar charm for you yes they are full of old memories do you never play or sing yourself aunt i play a little sometimes when i am quite alone but never to give pleasure to other people that seems unkind i remember how proud my father was of your musical talent but you would never let us hear you either at the hook or in parchment street i have never cared to play or sing before an audience since i was a girl you need not wonder at me mildred different people have different ways of thinking my pleasure in music of late years has been the pleasure of a listener mr castellani is good enough to gratify me sometimes as he has done to-night when he has nothing better to do do not say that exclaimed castellani coming into the glow of the hearth and seating himself beside miss fawcett's armchair what can i have better to do than to commune with a sympathetic mind like yours in the language of the dead it is almost as if my father's vanished voice were speaking to you he said in caressing tones bending down to kiss the thin pale hand which lay idle on the arm of the chair End of chapter four